Congratulations, Ukraine! Slava Ukraine! Some breaking news. It's been concluded that next year's contest cannot be held in Ukraine. The EBU is in talks with the BBC. It's Ukraine's party at our house. The city that will host Eurovision Song Contest. If you had asked runners at the BBC that they'd be hosting the competition a year from now, they'd have laughed in your face. No one's laughing now. This is a story of how the BBC and UAPBC came together to host the world's biggest singing competition in Liverpool. Thank you so much, yeah. I'm here in Liverpool at the MS Bank Arena, or the BBC Arena, where for two weeks it became the capital of the biggest singing competition in the world. The motto United by Music. It became a sterling opportunity for the BBC to flex its live show production know-how, hosting the competition with, and on behalf of winners, Ukraine, and produce one of the most critically acclaimed contests and the most watched Eurovision Grand Final ever. Creative and cultural cooperation with Ukraine was paramount, embedding them in every part of the production, from graphics and creative to specialist camera equipment. The UK's last hosting in 1998 had seen an explosion of Eurovision, with this being its record ninth time hosting the contest. Add this to another huge TV event just a weekend before. None of this was on the BBC's radar until late summer of 2022, meaning under a year to produce two of the biggest productions in the UK back to back. Oh yeah, he's definitely a Eurovision fan too. And like 1998, this year had a number of groundbreaking production innovations, some a bit too groundbreaking, but all adding to create a truly unique contest in a very unique year. You're good to go. Martina Stadal said I'm good to go. So from a silver medal in Turin to having the honor of hosting the competition, how did we get here? The ongoing conflict in Ukraine raised concerns for security and, after much investigation, the EBU began talks with and then passed the reins of hosting to runners-up United Kingdom. After it was formally announced that the UK would be hosting, cities across the nation went into overdrive for the titular honour of becoming host city. As 20 cities were whittled down to seven, Birmingham, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle and Sheffield. And then to two. But first, they need to get those douze points in the following. This is what we need. A venue holding at least 10,000 people. A press center for a maximum of 1,500 journalists. Next slide, please. It's, it's me. Um, easy access to an international airport and tons of swanky hotels for everyone to stay in. Now, previous cities seem to do this very well, but unfortunately doesn't quite make the mark this year. Birmingham last hosted in 1998. They lost out this year due to arena height issues. Manchester, of course, the biggest arena in the UK with 21,000 seats. They unfortunately lost out too. What about the capital city of London, I hear you ask? No, fortunately not, no. The BBC wanted to place more of its events outside of the capital city, Plus, the last three contests weren't in the capital anyway. So, this begs the question, where or dare? Let's put it down to two Eurovision greats. Glasgow or Liverpool? But one city stood at head and shoulders above the rest. Liverpool. Congratulations. A rich musical tapestry, well known for throwing a party, European Capital of Culture 2008, twin of Ukrainian city Odessa, tick, 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 tick. And it was very close between the, the two cities, but Liverpool had the edge. And I think if you were in Liverpool yourself, you will know that they did such an amazing job. And in front of you on a show day, there's like people with cowboy hats and sequins and the whole city just feels like it, it, it came alive and, and really embraced the, the idea of Eurovision. That's Lee Smithhurst, head of show, and Nikki Parsons, lead director of this year's production. We'll hear more from them a little bit later. But what you may have not known is, if it wasn't for an excited text on the night in May when the UK were in the lead, take a picture, we were really in the lead, it may have not come to Liverpool in the first place. Well, I was sitting by myself watching it at home and when Sam Ryder was winning, I didn't really understand all the rules and all of the stuff that, that the Superfans did and I texted Harry and just went, 
Should we? Should we? If we win Eurovision, if we, if we win Eurovision, should we try and get it for Liverpool? And you I did. Was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> However, wait for the public vote <laughs> to come in, Claire. <laughs> Where a uh, shall we suggestion turned into a ruddy good idea. And the science for all of this, the MS Bank Arena on Liverpool's waterfront. More about the venue and the staging a little bit later. Whew. Okay, back in my studio for this one. Now, even though this was a BBC production and it was held in the UK, for organisers, it was vital that Ukraine was to be visible and represented as much as possible from celebrating diversity and amplifying Ukrainian culture to ensuring authenticity by embedding them in the production, all underpinned by the slogan, United by Music. Ukraine wanted it to be a celebration of culture. They didn't want it to be somber. They wanted it to be everything that was great about their modern pop artists and their culture and their music and their heritage. That's Lee Smithhurst, head of show for this year's production. He, working with executive producer Andrew Cartmel, was responsible for the editorial and creative lead for the three live shows. That's everything from the script and graphics to presenters and sets design. Which is a huge responsibility, but as you know, I'm a fan of Eurovision. So for me, I've had ideas in my book for years and years where you think one day if we ever get to do it, I can use these ideas. With five previous contests behind him with the UK delegation, he's seen it all. From the lows of 2021, to the whiplash heights of 2022. He even got the signed seal of luck from UK entry Imani when it was last held here in 1998. That's true. So one of my very first jobs uh, when I was at uni was uh, on the National Lottery shows where they used to preview the UK Eurovision songs. I got the script um, for the live show on the Saturday night and she signed the back of it and she said something like to Lee, enjoy Eurovision, much love Imani. You know, 25 years later, you think, God, I never thought this would happen, that this would be the trajectory of that, that meeting. And now, even more so, pulling this show together, even with the time pressures of production starting in July, rather than the day after the final in May. So we were having to do a lot of things in parallel, so things like the set design, we were having to design a set without actually knowing which arena it would be in, which is quite difficult because obviously they don't know the parameters to what they're working towards, but you can come up with a general concept that then can be adapters and then we started to recruit the team so the key members were first so directors light and designers because they're all the people that would start building from the ground up then we would look at the editorial team either the contest team which was twan and his his contest team then it would be uh, our intervals team so myself dan shipton tom rosie and anna who were part of that we tried to make sure that we'd got across the board people who were just regular viewers of it and then the super fans who knew everything about it a big show requiring a big team. Here's a whistle-stop look at the UK-Ukraine connection. UK's design bridge and partners, formerly Super Union, talk about the perfect name, and Ukraine's Starlight Creative came together to create this year's vibrant theme art. A combination of meetings between both companies, even in challenging conditions with power cuts and missile strikes, allowed the optimistic spirit of Ukraine to thrive and inspire the design. Inspired by the idea of Eurovision being a two-week music festival, influenced the minimal colour palette, graphic shapes, and the bold condensed type seen on music posters, the font in this case being the hardy Penny Lane, paying tribute to Liverpool's street signs. The application of the motion graphics was carried out by British company North House, more on them a bit shortly. The show featured a range of Ukrainian and British talent. From host Yulia Sarnina, her name changing from English to Ukrainian Cyrillic in this track is a beautiful touch. Tima Miroshnichenko had a key role as secondary presenter to proceedings and on the turquoise carpet. Not to forget the stunning interval acts, featuring Alyosha of 2010 teaming up with Rebecca Ferguson, an immersive performance of LED and special effects, with a complex backstory with creative multimedia company Freckled Sky. We had to build the LED boxes here in the UK, in Liverpool. Um, for us to rehearse with, but they we couldn't get them to Ukraine. So the Ukrainians were in a warehouse, they would build the white boxes and project onto them so they'd be able to map their content and be able to rehearse with it properly. So there were lots of things that we were having to do twice and it's quite difficult to obviously fly them in and out all the time. So we we flew the Ukrainian team and the team from the US in two weeks before to Liverpool to rehearse. They had five hours on set and then they all flew back again and then they came back for the contest week. And as teased by Lee and creative director Dan Shipton about the big change, we had a remarkable twist in qualifier announcements, 
which was reversed ahead of the first semi-final broadcast. This was an idea discussed with the BBC production team, the EBU and the reference group as a way to improve the results with more cameras and better coverage of the artists. Now this isn't a new way of announcement reveals being popularised in similar shows like Melody Festivalen. This of course was tested in dress rehearsal 1 to see how it looked and as it transpired it didn't work as well as the traditional way, the producers decided then and there to revert back to the former reveal. Now it's standard practice to test things out in TV rehearsals and then change for the record or live broadcast, but unfortunately this met the ire of thousands of Eurovision fans. With the ideal UK-Ukraine balance struck, the show did manage to have its own distinct British flavour. From cake stands and cups of tea in the green room, which was also there during rehearsals, and the very Graham Norton chat show style of the TV with the couches, popular British music in the immersive flag parade, where else would you hear Blur back to back with Verka Shaduchka, not to forget Peppa Pig, but also some treasured Eurovision gems to restore some feel-good memories. It means nothing to anyone, but as a kid when I used to watch Eurovision, they always used to say in the script before the first song, the honour of opening the Eurovision Song Contest goes to Cyprus. And some, for some reason it just disappeared over the years, it never came back, but when I was a kid and I used to pretend that I was presenting Eurovision, that was a line that I always remember saying, and so we put that back in again this year. The honour of opening the grand final goes to... Austria! Yeah! Everyone has a little thing that they remember about it from growing up or one thing that they used to reenact, whatever it might be. And I tried to put as many that I could remember in of what, what made me excited when I was a kid and watching it. There are also other little things along the way that we enjoy about Eurovision that only happen in Eurovision. So, with the show production brewing away, you need a stage to serve it on. But first, do you live, laugh, love? <laughs> Forget that. How about Love Laugh Liverpool with my stunning range of Eurovision wall art? Yes, that's right. Fliss approved merch. P-E-D-B gone. And adorn your living space with vibrant posters that bring that G-P-E. That's Grand Prix energy. Will you be going crazy and party with Keria in your kitchen? Long for a love lost with Marco in your bedroom. Or be stuck on your wall like a tattoo with Laureen in your lounge. I personally love screaming in my underpants, Let Three's Mama, Shoo, and all digitally handmade. First 50 customers get an additional 10% off with the code FLISS. Check out the link on screen and blast your post Eurovision depression, giving your living space the 12 point treatment. Okay, shameless advert over. Let's go back to the love, laugh, Liverpool madness. And so we come to our venue, the twin headed MS Bank Arena. This is not just any arena, it's a Marks and Spencer arena. Or the BBC arena of sorts at the time of broadcast. In fact, this isn't the first time an arena has had their dress up. Germany 2011 had their then Esprit Arena sign Eurovision fired, providing a grand beacon for this cathedral of song. And into the intimate yet spacious arena we go, where, including the stage, was home to about 7,000 people, where the stage quite literally reaches out to you. United by a hug was a concept that stage designer Julio Himede had when creating the vast and technically impressive set. Inspiration from Ukrainian and British art and design led him to this arched set piece and the idea of Liverpool welcoming viewers from Europe and Ukraine with open arms. Julio's always said in his design that it was it was meant to be like an outstretching hug, which is why the stage comes out quite wide and it feels like it envelops the audience in it. And you just knew when you saw it that this is a special design. I actually quite like how the design covertly recalls the look of 1998's arcs, right down to this light sandwiched in between. We'll get to lighting in a second. Being no rookie to the stage design game, you name it, Julio and his company Yellow Studio probably designed it. In fact, technically, this contest isn't the first Eurovisionally related production, as himself and his studio was behind the American Song Contest staging just last year. Let's take a closer look at the stage. 220 square meters of LED formed seven massive towers backing the set, 10 meters high. All seven can move, where the inner five have the ability to rotate 720 degrees and incredibly quickly too, as they can move independently to help shift huge props on and off stage in a trademark 50 second window. Plus, in true Eurovision style, there's 190 light fixtures behind these doors and another wall of lights behind that too. The rigging for this was built and tested in Belgium by automation company WeCreations, with their rigging and automation hidden in the maze of the ceiling. 
Constructed by Stage 1, they've crafted various stage pieces for the UK's entries, but this is the first time they're building the entire set. Over 260 individual pieces were built on their site in their workshop in Yorkshire, working around the clock over two weeks to be assembled on site at the arena. Award-winning lighting designer Tim Routledge was behind the vast lighting rig and headed up the Harley team of programmers working 24 hours around the clock. Programming took over three weeks with lighting supplier Neg Earth. But when all the lights at your disposal isn't quite enough, why not create your own? And that's exactly what he did. Sandwiched in the rig of lights are the Svoboda pods. Inspired by design work from Josef Svoboda and his self-titled light fixture, introduced to Tim by his late father, he created a modern version of this giving a striking effect. Other movers and shakers, other than the performers mind you, include 22 fixtures on rising platforms which are completely wireless. And the rings with LED within, just like the stage reaching out to hug you, come down as well. Follow spots are controlled in a room of small ways behind the stage, with a team of 15, including 7 students, from local arts colleges in Liverpool. Looking like a complex flight simulator, it has a camera mounted on the underside of the light, allowing some pretty cool never before seen angles of the stage. And with visuals comes the ever vital sound. It is a song contest after all. Over 400 sources, over 100 microphones and 64 playback channels is carefully balanced by the head of sound, Robert Edwards. He was responsible for the world broadcast mixes in the Portuguese contest in 2018. The importance of sound is multifold, as time code for each performance is based here. Each entry is delivered in a multi-track sequence which contains time code triggers for lighting, screen content, automation, even the time code that QPilot works on. All of this is synchronized and controlled in the monitor world and clocks around backstage keep you updated right to the second. When the director gets the all clear that the stage is ready, their call triggers play in this part of the arena where everything begins. The trademark in-ear monitor station system gets performers ready, where performers have to stand in the right coloured box to get a corresponding mic and earpiece. But new for the contest this year, performers have a private 20 minute session to get their sound just right before they head off to get connected up. Screen content is king, with the set essentially being a massive LED canvas. Live event visual specialists Disguise provided 10 servers pumping terabytes of content onto these large set pieces. Looked after by head of video Chris Saunders, content and displays were all synced to timecode as well and have the ability to layer some complex video and stick some text on screen too. And with form comes function, as the screens were super useful in the running of the show. Back in the day, it was all about duct tape. Fast forward to the mid 2010s, we were lucky to have lasers, but an ingenious idea was to turn the stage floor into a live plotting screen, vital when you have 50 seconds to turn around the stage. Echoing the solution seen in the Rotterdam 2021 contest, Disguise and the head of video came up with a solution to provide stage markings controllable using an iPad. Spike marks, as they were called, were based on CAD drawings by the production Strauss people. And as it was all live and digital, it allowed tweaks even during rehearsals. No tape, no fuss, no muss. Screen content also included projection mapping for the Ukrainian and the Armenian performances, with a stack of projectors set up hundreds of meters at the back of the arena. Okay, tech stuff out the way, let's see the fruits of all of this labour, the show itself. Now it's one thing being in the arena and watching the show live, and I did and it was incredible, absolutely worth it. But the contest raison d'etre is chiefly a TV show, and a dazzling one at that. And it brings lots of challenges with it, but it's also the most exciting thing I've worked on for a long time. That's Nikki Parsons, lead director of the contest. Among other massive shiny floor and live shows and events, she's series director of the equally extravagant sequined Strictly Come Dancing, a role held since series four in 2006. But there's a link here between Nikki, dance and Eurovision. Yes, there was a thing once upon a time called the Eurovision Dance Contest. <laughs> Dance Contest 2008, live from Glasgow in Scotland! And I believe it was two years. It didn't last very long. For this year's contest, she was part of a team featuring two other seasoned directors to bring the contest to life on screen. Ollie Bartlett with credits from Glastonbury to Secret Night with Kylie, and Richard Valentine who's directed shows from Concert for Ukraine, One Love Manchester, all to name just a few. 
At the beginning, I was very much like, why do we need three directors? And quite quickly, I, I learned why we needed three directors. It's such an intense time as well that we'd rehearse all day. Myself and Ollie would do the delegations during the day and then like at 6, 6.30 in the evening, then Richard would take over and do the interval acts and the opening performances. We were there to support each other and talk things through and yeah, it was fun. Coming to terms with directing 37 countries would certainly keep the most seasoned of directors awake at night. But sometimes the art of speedy conversation can make all the difference. Early on in the process, there's this thing they called speed dating, which I was really looking forward to. It's a process where the delegations present to us their creative for their song for, the, for that year and for us to give feedback on what we think is achievable, what isn't achievable, and how we can deliver them what they want on the night. And so then you have a personality in your mind when you're creating your, your camera script and the performance. A show like Eurovision is built on redundancies, backups, and a plan B. It's a must on a show of this size. But what's really interesting is how it's baked into the show's script ever ready if needed. So we had like some VTs on standby that you could play in if something went wrong. Our fabulous host Alicia was constantly on standby so that if you were coming out of the postcard with like 10 seconds to go and the stage wasn't ready, you can say coming out to a wide shot, going to Alicia, cut to Alicia. Alicia just reads off lots of facts, chats to people in the green room as if nothing's happening. And then you pick up and you carry on. But I think by the time we got to the live shows, anything that could go wrong had probably gone wrong and it didn't happen on the live shows which is great. 26 Sony cameras capture all the action on stage ranging from a 2D camera zipping back and forth and up and down through the arena, not one, not two, but five camera rails, two on the front of the stage, one around the oval stage, one midway sandwiched between the back of the standing audience and the camera bank and one at the very back behind the green room. Four remote heads. Some of them have the telescopic ability to reach great heights. Three whizzing steady cams and two whopping telescopic cranes. A movie bird 52 on camera left and a movie bird 45 on camera right. Three sets of these cameras further highlight the Ukrainian connection. Being specialized cameras from Ukrainian company Opatech. The two cranes, five rails and the 2D camera are supplied and controlled by the team and have been a long time Eurovision partner. This is their sixth year in a row. Our operator of the 2D spider cam, he was absolutely amazing. He was brilliant and really cared about every single shot. And then the, the grips on the technocrane. I've never seen the technocrane move so fast. They were, they were amazing. Traditionally, music performances in the UK use a system of beat counting to cut cameras to the mood and style of the song, kept ticking along by the script supervisor and cut by the vision mixer. However, this was made all the more complex yet easier with live multi-camera switcher QPilot. None of us had used QPilot Q before and none of our camera crew or our script supervisors or anyone basically used QPilot before. So it was a whole learning experience for everybody. Once we got our heads around it, we really enjoyed it. And I don't think we, we would have survived without it because it's quite, it's such a huge complicated show. The whole point of Eurovision is for each delegation to have the best performance that they can have facilitated by the host broadcaster. So it really helps you to do that. Now a Eurovision staple since introduction in 2014, providing dazzling exact results every time, but also helped with the demands of delegations with reference to shot numbers and timings. This year saw a grand total of 2,139 cuts. At the top of the leaderboard with 103 is Germany's Blood and Glitter. And last but certainly not least is Italy's Due Vite with 46 cuts. And to help supplement the system of using beat counting, a handy view on the screen reveals a song beats and bars, which is actually very satisfying to watch. Here's some camera direction highlights. Remember 2022's Chechia Dolly Zoom? Well, Slovenia's Joker Out and San Marino's Peaked Jax features this with the 2D cam. The rail shots around the catwalk are so gyro balanced that even at high speed, there's no wiggle. Almost similar to Steadicam coming up close from below. Poland featuring a fish eye lens. Never seen before in Eurovision, but well used to bring those music video hazy days of the 80s and 90s. Israel's dance break features a low slung setup of the Steadicam, allowing the viewer to get down, just like Noah, a first at Eurovision. And how is this a full circle? No pun intended, for Marco Mangoni of Italy. 
his performance featuring the ever classic Eurovision Steadicam Orbit also happened during his Eurovision performance 10 years earlier. Literally full circle. I'll, I'll, I'll get my coat. All of this heads through a series of trucks in the OB compound. The broadcast ones, like previous years, are supplied by NEP. The standard main and backup truck setup is here, with a truck each from NEP Netherlands and Sweden. NEP were also behind the voting graphics. Speaking of graphics... As touched on earlier, Design Bridge and Partners of the UK and Starlight Creative of Ukraine joined forces to create this year's theme art. Starlight Creative took things further, producing performance visuals for a number of countries, including Ireland, Romania, Slovenia and for Rita Ora. As for the majority of the show's MoGraph content, this was produced by British company North House Creative, producing the vibrant visuals for the flag parade and the six opening and interval acts, from Be Who You Want To Be to millions of Dazi Freya heads. Just to emphasise the fact that after many a Eurovision try, he's here live. There's so many of them. They headed up the bold broadcast graphics of the transitions, song title, name straps and the voting recap, the 3D-fied house graphics and the all-important scoreboard design and animation. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice some similarities between this year and Rotterdam 21. No coincidence there. Broadcast supplier NEP Creative Netherlands and Creative Animal, who looked after the scoreboard two years ago, are behind the control of this. Been a bit of a busy weekend for North House Creative. They were behind projection and screen visuals of the King's Coronation concert just the weekend before. So you may be watching the performances going, how did he do that? Here's a quick look. The real magic to George's performance, actual dress waivers, hidden behind the massive LED doors. Plus, this is a great example of seeing just how far downstage these could come. One of the quickest stagehand moves is lifting Finland's hot pink leashes in place in mere milliseconds, barely visible on camera. Also, if you look really closely, the dancers hide the removals of these leashes with some very slick, emphasis on lick, dancing. Croatia's Let 3 is infamous for sometimes getting the Let 3s out on stage. Now to circumvent this at Eurovision, the floor manager was on standby, double checking their jackets before every performance to ensure they had underpants on. And another example of stage blink and you'll miss it magic, the UK wheels on steps to allow May Miller to descend and smart camera angles hide a staircase move out of sight just as quickly. The backing dancers have less of a luxury though, they hop off at the back. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, but close because Netta did actually fly a plane in 2019. Yeah, but this year there's actually a bird involved. So the bird had to be made to fit onto three winch points, but it couldn't live up there the whole time because it was too big. So the bird had to be made sort of in three parts. Before Netta goes up, the body comes down on the winches, the wings attach on, Netta gets on and then she goes up in the roof for I think five minutes before she actually performs. She had to wear a harness to be clipped onto the, the bird and that has to be so precise. We could ask her to just measure herself like you would with a tape measure, but if it's wrong and she gets here, then that's quite a big issue. So we asked Netta to have a 3D body scan, which she did in Israel. So we had a 3D model of Netta rotated around so we could see exactly how big we needed to make the harness to be able to fit around her. And you can always trust a good prophylactic, especially at Eurovision. Joe Karout were all over them, but especially for wet, because water, mind, Cornelia Jacobs, where a hardy condom was used to help protect her mic and sound pack from the splashy watery elements. So all the songs are sung, intervals are intervaled, but before we get the... You're good to go. ...from Mr. Esterdal, let's talk voting and its very complex coordination. Eurovision's technical services coordinate all the contributing country spokespersons by satellite, fibre and IP to the master control room in Liverpool a vital container in the OP village at the back of the arena. No other production works with as many live international inputs simultaneously. During the show, all 37 are coordinated and produced. This is the voting circuit from Ukraine. With communication between the spokesperson studio and Liverpool to ensure they're prepared and ready to go. When it's time to reveal the jury votes, tech services connect to each spokesperson one by one, sending a main and a backup signal direct from the country by way of their master control room straight to the OB van. Until of course they reach the UK, featuring Catherine Tate live in the arena. 
Allons-y! With data securely fed from the voting platform, graphics are added and inserted locally. While this is happening, the public's votes are being counted and verified by voting partner The Game and observers from E and Y, with the totted up numbers securely fed from the voting platform to the graphics team, ready to be revealed. So with that, Hannah and Graham, for the final result, you're good to go. Oh, we're good to go. We're good. With tight cybersecurity and this technically complex operation, ample rehearsals are undertaken where they prepare for every eventuality say an overzealous country perhaps. 12 points, go to Portugal. Sorry, Vana, this is not the information we've got. May we have your real 12 points, please? And what was really nice, after a winning week of shows and rehearsals, we saw the United Kingdom win the Saturday afternoon rehearsal show. A thrilling moment on home turf, even if it is just a rehearsal. It's that time, here's some of my favourite moments of the show. Peppa Pig, not just that, but fully credited as Peppa Pig. A great British export, of course, so it makes total sense, but also an editorial nod to shows like Strictly Come Dancing that have a funny gag whenever the vote lines are open. Don't worry, Julia, we'll explain to you later. <laughs> Take that, Susie Sheep. The graphics, breaking convention and providing a fresh new design. The scoreboard especially is a nice one, but what I really like, how they slow down the points reveal to really build up who got the first 10 points. You could hear the slow dawning shock when Greece broke convention after giving Cyprus 4 points. The quintessentially British reactions by Graham and Hannah. Graham Norton is speaking for God's well, sake. Look, but they're very excited and rightly I mean... so. Speaking of Britishness, the addition of Kate Middleton was so top secret it was only revealed when the show went live on Saturday night. Alicia's rap, Julia's charmingness, Hannah, ju just Hannah, and Graham whenever he got caught out dancing, king of poker face. All the signers giving every performance 110%. And as Graham said, I know, I know, it's been a long time, it's been a long time. The roar of the crowd with the UK quite aptly closing the contest. In fact, the fact that the very own host country in this very unique year closed the show was just a stroke of perfect show luck. And you've got to get this on slow motion by check out the host dancing as well. So, that's just a little insight. Well, not really little insight into how they made the world's biggest singing competition here in Liverpool. A production that went beyond expectations. United Cultures, technically and visually dazzled, resulting in the most watched grand final ever. It kept and refreshed the six decade old format right up to date and actually was a reflection of what Eurovision set out to do. A technical TV experiment uniting Europe through music, where the uniting of countries behind the screen was vital. What an amazing experience to be to be part of. And I think if you talk to any member of the team, we all have that same feeling. It was such a great experience. We were with really great people, really talented people. We got to the Sunday and people were really tired, but People didn't actually want to go home because we'd, we'd got cabin fever. We'd been there for so long together. And I'm working on such a fantastic project with all the delegations from all over Europe. What's not to like about it? Yeah, brilliant experience. What were your favourite parts of the show? Stuff that made you go... Yes! Or make you go... Oh. <laughs> yeah, look, look at the faces! <laughs> Let me know in the comments section below. A massive thank you and a top of the board 12 points to my special guests, director Nikki Parsons and head of show Lee Smithhurst, giving a further invaluable insight. And of course, a special thanks to the key people that's made this episode possible. For more live show show goodness, check out the other videos on my channel and take home a piece of Eurovision art. Yes, that's right, it's Fliss merch. Adorn your living room with vibrant art featuring your favorite artists. Plus, the first 50 people to get on it with the code FLISS gets an extra 10% off. In the words of Keria, It's crazy! It's party! <laughs> it sure is. And until next time, people, always remember, stay live and hit record. I've got a show to watch. Peace.